Hey, everybody, it's Lynn, and I am here solo today. I'm without my co-pilot, Robin, which aptly, she is on an airplane. So what a very good metaphor I'm using. She is flying on a plane, and I am flying solo here in the Fluster Clux chair. I'm sort of on vacation, too, and we are recasting an episode that we did in season three that addresses the truth about phobias. And once again, it really focuses on this idea that the content doesn't matter. And sometimes, to be honest with you, I feel like, gosh, everybody gets that. Everybody understands that I'm really talking about the process, that what you worry about is not the thing. And that if your child has a specific phobia, it doesn't really matter to me that much what the phobia is. And I don't want to create a treatment plan that talks so much about the details about the specific phobia. And I feel like I say that over and over and over again. And I feel a little self-conscious of saying like, gosh, I really am beating this drum. And yet, I receive questions in the podcast group and emails from people and when I do presentations that consistently show me that this concept of not paying attention to the content is really probably the trickiest thing, the hardest thing for people to absorb and understand. People will send me an email that says, well, I listen to the podcast and I really appreciate what you say, but my child has a fear of blank. What do I do about that? And the answer is you do the process. So as you're listening to this episode, and perhaps you've heard it before, listen to it again. If you're new to the podcast, if you've been listening to our summer series, this may be a really different concept for you. And again, I feel like I talk about it all the time, but I think it's hard to absorb. And yet it is the meat of the sandwich of what I do. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're having a lovely summer. We will be back. We're continuing our summer series. Robin's on an airplane. I'm on vacation. You need to hear about content versus process. It's a win, 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 people. Don't you think? I think so. Enjoy. What's the truth about phobias? Some kids become afraid of a variety of things. Throwing up, needles, dogs, thunderstorms. We want to make our kids feel safe and comfortable. But how we do that often just makes the worry and the fear stronger. Because when we try and address what our kids are actually worried about, we invite anxiety to move in and take hold. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. So Lynn, you know what I think is a good conversation for us to have today is to really unpack the phrase you use a lot, content versus process. You say that a lot, and I think that people who might be newer listeners might not really know what that means. And I think that we should really unpack that. And even if you know what that means, for some reason, I feel like parents give you pushback on it. Oh, yeah. That's a great conversation to have because the content versus process thing is really what defines a lot of the work that I do. And it's not just parents who have some difficulty with it. I do a lot of trainings with clinicians and we're constantly talking about it because it's a different way of thinking about worry and anxiety. And it really is contrary to what a lot of us even are trained or what a lot of us believe about how to handle worry when it shows up. So sometimes when I'm talking about content versus process, I really appreciate the opportunity to explain it again, but it's not a natural response to this worry thing when it shows up. Okay. So what I'm hearing is but you have a slightly more outlier view of this and you do because it works. And we're going to sort of give an example. Okay. Let's take vomiting. Fear of vomiting is really common in kids Mm -hmm. and adults. Yep. So a parent notices that the child is all of a sudden afraid of vomiting. Yes. And there's a fancy word for it. What's that word? A metaphobia. Okay. So then you have this child who suddenly is afraid of vomiting. But truthfully, this could be 
bumblebees, dogs, lightning, anything. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. And let me ask you this question too. Is there a certain age where this sort of specific phobia is most commonly likely to appear? Not really. It can appear early. So, and also the thing about phobias, and if we talk about specific phobias, is that they jump around developmentally. So, you know, if you get stung by a bee, then you might develop a fear of getting stung by a bee. If you have a particular sickness and you have a little stomach, you know, a tummy bug, then you might develop a fear of vomiting. They can show up pretty early for sure. There's also a part of these fears that are normal. So it's normal for kids to go through a period of separation fears or darkness fears or worrying about monsters in the closet fears. The throw up thing shows up probably around six, seven, eight, sometimes a little bit later. Throw up is a good example to use as content example in this because it becomes so overpowering to family sometimes. What does that mean it becomes overpowering? So a parent notices that a child says, I'm afraid to throw up. Right. I don't want to throw up. Yep. I don't want to throw up. So, okay. So remember, we like to talk about anxiety as the cult leader. So the cult leader shows up and now we, what we want to do instinctively is to do what I call a content-based intervention, which means now we want to remove the fear So we want to create certainty. We want to create comfort. So we start stepping in and trying to do things externally that will make our child not be so afraid of throwing up. So we might do things like remove certain foods or give them over-the-counter medications. Like I want you to carry around a packet of Tums in your pocket. We might stop doing certain activities, like they're not going to ride the school bus anymore, or when they ride in the car, they have to sit in the front seat, or they can't ride in other people's cars, or they're not going to go to this place or that place. So it becomes all-encompassing because we know that throw-up is pretty darn unpredictable. And we also know that it's probably going to happen. We know that it's very unpleasant. And so we start to step in and try and reassure and make it okay, get rid of the throwing up part instead of dealing with the worry. So the biggest difference, when I say content, I'm talking about the thing that you're worried about. And when I'm talking process, I'm talking about your relationship to worry. And that's what I want to focus on. So when we get into the content, when we provide this reassurance, when we try and accommodate, when we try and put things in place, we're trying to change the content in order to decrease the worry. And what I want to do is have you learn how to respond to the worry differently when it shows up, regardless of what it's about. Because I don't really care what it's about in terms of my treatment. Doesn't matter to me what it's about. Well, I think you should also clarify, you don't care because if you do focus on the content, it's not addressing the worry and the content's just going to have a different thing later on. Right. And I say I don't care about it, which means that the meaning of the content or how it showed up or why it showed up or what we're going to do about it, all of that is irrelevant to me because say, for example, we're able to get rid of a content that you're afraid of. Say you live in Florida and so you have a big fear of alligators and then you move to New Hampshire So now we've removed the content because we don't have alligators swimming around in the ponds, but now some other fear might show up. Some other content might show up. So if we don't teach kids how to manage their worry when it shows up, then it's just going to be that whack-a-mole game and another fear will show up. And even if it sticks with one thing, even if it really sticks with vomiting, for example, here's what we want to do. Let me just walk you through it a little bit. So vomiting is the content. So your child is really afraid that they're going to throw up. If you get caught in the content, you start rearranging the world. We know we're not going to do that. So how do you talk to your kid about process? Well, remember, we externalize the worry. We name it Sally. We name it Joanne. And then when the worry shows up, The worry is going to want to talk about the content, right? The worry is going to show up. Joanne's going to show up and say, you might throw up. Oh my gosh, your tummy's starting to hurt. Oh my gosh, you ate that food that you threw up when you ate it four years ago, (gasps) right? So the worry wants to get into the content. And what we want to do is we want to say to Joanne, 
This is process language. We want to say to Joanne, Joanne, you always show up. You bug me. You try and freak me out. And I am not going to let you be the boss of me. So I know you're going to show up because remember, we're not going to eliminate it. I know you're going to show up. I know you're going to try and freak me out. I can handle this and I'm not going to spend all my time trying to give you what you want. Now, this is what we want parents to say to kids. They don't like this because they want you to get rid of their uncertainty. They want you to get rid of throw up. They want you to get rid of darkness. They want you to get rid of vampires. But what you want to teach your kids is when worry shows up, we're going to turn to the worry and say, worry, I know you're good at freaking me out. I'm not going to let you rule my life. Now, we might say, you know what? We don't know exactly when you're going to throw up. And that's hard because life is uncertain. So sometimes we can say that. It's harder to say that if your child is afraid of, for example, dying while they're sleeping. That's an extreme example. But say your child is afraid, oh, if I go to sleep, mommy, I might die. We don't want to say, well, you know, life is uncertain and who knows, and it could happen. That's not going to help. So say your child is afraid of, they say, oh, mommy, what if I go to sleep and I die? You say, you know what? That's your worry scaring you again right? Hello, Salvatore. That's what we named the worry. Hello, Salvatore. You always show up at night. Stop grabbing onto my kid's imagination and freaking them out, right? Worry, I know this is what you do, but we're not going to make you so powerful. That's process talk. Salvatore is a great worry name, by the way. I know it is. I just came up with that myself. That's an original. I usually go with like Karen or Sally or Joanne, but... There was a family that maybe you could talk about because it illustrates the point about the whack-a-mole. Like Mm -hmm. when you say the whack-a-mole, there was a family that had a daughter who was worried about security. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what that looks like and when a parent is chasing up the content tree instead of the process tree. Yeah. So this was a while ago. So this was a not an unusual fear, very, very afraid that somebody was going to break into the house and kidnap her. So the parents decided that they were going to do everything they could to make sure that she felt safe and secure. If the dad, I remember they told me one story, the dad went, they had like a a sliding glass door and the dad would go out on the patio to grill a hamburger and he would go out to grill the hamburger and she would lock the door after him and he'd be standing there like, I can't get back in. So they got a $50,000 alarm system so that she would feel safe and secure. And it worked for a period of time and then it stopped working. She stopped feeling safe and secure. And I think it was because she was watching some movies like Ocean's Eleven or some James Bond movie where the criminal was able to go through the alarm system so that she was like, nope, that's not going to work. They bought a 150 pound bull mastiff so that she could have a big, huge dog in her room to protect her. And they just kept saying, we're going to do everything we can to make you feel safe. That didn't work either because they would shut the door with the dog in a room and the dog didn't want to stay in the room. So the dog would just bark. So that didn't work either. That's when they came to me and they said, we've got this problem. She doesn't feel safe. What else can we do to help her feel safe? And I said, well, you got to get out of the content because we have to teach her how to deal with her worry when her worry shows up. Because you can keep playing whack-a-mole. You can keep doing all of these different things to try and make your feel safe. Even if you could get an alarm system or a dog or a pet tiger or a full-time security guard, she'll find something else to worry about because her worry takes over and it conjures up all this uncertainty and these feelings of, of disaster. That's what we have to work on. Let's hear more of that after we come back from our break. Lynn, every summer I say this, I think that summer's going to be this relaxing experience. And I don't know why, but summer is actually just as stressful as the rest of the year with all these things happening. Well, you know what? I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make summer great. So we're still managing anxiety. This is why we need healthy outlets and support for our stress as well. That's why any stressed out mama should check out Metabolic Reds by Pure Health Research. Metabolic Reds is a delicious superfood blend that contains wonderful adaptogens like ashwagandha. 
Adaptogens are known as nature's stress busters, known for a remarkably calming effect. Plus, the many other organic red fruits, probiotics, and digestive enzymes help boost your energy levels all day long while igniting your metabolism. And let us mention, too, that metabolic reds taste like a delicious berry smoothie. It does. I tried it. It's really delicious. As a listener of our show, you can try Metabolic Reds risk-free today and get a free bottle of Metabolic Greens with your first order. So go to getreds.com slash fluster to learn more. That's getreds.com slash fluster to purchase Metabolic Reds and claim your free gift. Go to getreds.com slash fluster now and get started. We need all the energetic help we can just to keep up with our summer schedules. Lynn, I just tried a product that parents need to know about. Yipes wipes. I know, me too. I was using them yesterday, actually. You know, I'll tell you, I didn't think I'd be so excited about wipes, but they are really great. They smell wonderful. They work great. Yipes wipes are a kid's face and hand wipe designed to teach kids to develop independent, healthy habits. They were started by a mom who wanted to embrace the messy side of growing up. Messes are a way to learn, grow, and have fun. I think we have a whole episode about that. Yes. You know, I am all for messes. So let them get messy and then use safe yipes to remove all of the icky stuff. You can feel good about yipes wipes being safe for kids. No parabens or petroleum, 99% plant-derived, they're hypoallergenic, they're dermatologist-tested, they're 98% water, and they're plastic-free wipes. I love that they're compostable because we got a big compost in the back. They're 94% biodegradable. They're not tested on animals. They also come in these great individual sachets, perfect for on the go, or you can get a big canister to use at home. They're perfect to throw in backpacks, lunch boxes, after sports practice, in the car, at the movies, or at home, sitting on the kitchen counter. Go to yipeswipes.com slash fluster for 20% off. Once again, that's yipeswipes.com slash fluster. Or just enter fluster at checkout for 20% off at yipeswipes.com. Growing up is messy. So we've got yipes wipes to the rescue. Okay, we're back. Do you find that in addition to the whack-a-mole problem, do you find that parents are sometimes resistant to accepting that it is a process of worry and that they they insist that, oh, no, 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 she has a fear of dogs because the neighbor's dog bit my daughter and so she's terrified of dogs. There's nothing else but the dog bite here and this is what I want to help with. If the parents are resistant and stubborn that it's just the content, does that happen as well? Yeah. So in that example, if a child did get bit by a dog and then they had that traumatic experience and they were afraid of dogs, it probably in that case, we would say like, okay, so this was a direct result of getting bit by the dog, but we still want to talk to her about how she's going to manage her worry when it shows up about all dogs now. But I think There are many examples where the child develops some sort of fear, some sort of worry about something, and the parents are determined to make some connection to an event. So I remember actually, here's a story. I was working with this girl who was really fearful of throwing up. Again, not uncommon, really, really fearful. And she went to this other therapist and the other therapist really got into sort of figuring out about what was going on in her childhood. And really what she was afraid of is she had a fear of suffocation. And that was probably representative of the fact that she couldn't find her voice in the family. And I was like, oh my God, right? You're gonna <laughs> we do not have to go down that path. What she's afraid of is throwing up. Why? Because throwing up is gross. It's unpredictable. And she's made it into this huge thing in her mind that she can't handle. Or that she can't control. That she can't control. Right. I mean, that's the nature of it. Who wants to throw up? It's gross. I say to kids all the time, if you liked it, that would be weird. I say that about needles. They go, oh, I'm afraid of needles. Yeah. If you like needles, that would be kind of bizarre. Parents want to pin it on something. They want to find something. It's the same thing when a kid is really having a lot of worry about school. So we get way into the content like, well, it must be the teacher or it must be the lunch lady or it must be the bus driver or it must be this other kid. And they go around trying to figure out what's happening in school that's making their child worry rather than saying, we need to address this pattern of 
anxiety and worry and doubt and seeking certainty, that's what I want to look at. Think of the patterns. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about process. I'm talking about how worry works. What does it do in families? What does it do inside of us? And it it gets us away from trying to figure out and make these connections. I think that sometimes parents just want the answer, of course, right? There's something that's scaring their child, and so they want to figure it out, and when they want to re- remove it. But unfortunately, it doesn't teach how to manage worry when it shows up, and oftentimes something else just comes in and takes its place. Or it's something that we can't get rid of. You cannot get rid of vomiting, right? You can't get rid of death. You can't get rid of being embarrassed. And when we try and get rid of it, we're going down the wrong path. Now I've been a parent several years with you as my sister-in-law, so I've absorbed a lot more. But in the very beginning, in my early years of parenting, I had a lot of learning to do. You would say these phrases and it just wouldn't necessarily register. Mm -hmm. So when parents are resistant, sometimes they're resistant because they they simply don't understand how worry works either, Mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of people just don't get it. Yeah. That's why we have such skyrocketing rates of anxiety disorders in adults too. And so when our child is needing a resource that we ourselves haven't yet learned, Mm -hmm. that's challenging. And the parent needs the education on that too. Putting the investment of really understanding worry is such a family gift for both generations. Absolutely. And also just to, you know, like say this in support of parents too, there are a lot of people who treat anxiety who get caught in the content. A parent is like their child is really afraid of something and then they go take them to a professional and the professional says, well, let's make sure that the child feels safe about this. And so when we're saying, you know, parents get really stuck in the content, let me just emphasize that people who treat kids who have worry get stuck in the content too. It's easy to do. I can give you an example of that that just happened recently. A child with a contamination fear So she's worried that she's going to get germs. And this was happening before COVID, but if COVID didn't make it any better. So the parents take her to this person who is supposed to be really good at treating anxious kids. And the things that they told the parents to do would be the exact opposite of what I would say. They said, make sure that she has her own water bottle that she knows nobody else will go near. So she knows that's safe. Have her watch you empty the dishwasher so she knows that all of the dishes have been cleaned and you're putting them away without anything getting on them. I'm still surprised that that happens. So I don't really blame the parents. Like you say, they don't know how anxiety works and they're just trying to take away the distress and they're just trying to do things that work immediately. That's why the content stuff is so compelling and so alluring. But we really want to bump it up a notch. We really want to teach kids how worry works. We want to teach adults how worry works and how do we respond differently. The relationship is between the child and their worry, regardless of what they're worrying about. It's interesting that other clinicians still get lost in the content because what the process does is it strengthens the ability to distance oneself from one's feelings. Correct. Which is the goal of mental health. Correct. So like, why is that not so obvious, you know, to other clinicians? I don't know. It's a good question. It's a really good question. If you treat the content, you're just, I think any clinician would understand that they're enabling a sense of control. They're enabling all of these things that are quite the opposite. Yeah. I don't have the answer to that question. And I, you know, I train a lot of clinicians. And as I said at the beginning, like I'm doing a training, clinicians, I'm doing a training on June 4th. We're going to talk about content versus process. But the reason I'm doing this training is because it really is, if you haven't, if you haven't thought about it in this way, so say you become a clinician and you learn these things, say you work as a school counselor and all the accommodations that you've been taught to put into place are all about removing the things that makes a child anxious. Say that you have heard all about trigger warnings. Say that you've heard all about safe spaces. All of your training has been how do we reduce distress? Then thinking about this is a real big shift. And it is a big shift. It seems it's obvious to me because this is the way I've always thought about it and it's the way I've been trained. And part of what I have to do is to remember that the content language is so pervasive 
And the content approach is so pervasive that it really is a big paradigm shift for a lot of people. But, and it's obvious to you now too. So when I talk about it, when, when you hear somebody doing a content-based intervention, when you hear somebody stepping in and doing the disorder, because you've been listening to me for so long, it sounds like nails on the chalkboard to you two now too, right? You can just pick it up like that. I think it's interesting when I have these conversations with friends of mine about their kids, I, I hear there's that there's a wall that goes up in mm-hmm. that sense where they they don't want to talk about an anxiety approach in general. They want to stick with the content. So yeah. I guess it's what happens is they learn maybe just this content approach isn't doing the change that they need over time. And then they start opening up about the rest of anxiety as a whole. Yeah. It takes a lot of explaining, you know, when a family comes in and they've been doing the reassurance, they've been doing the accommodations, they've been trying to rearrange the world, and they don't understand why it's not getting better. And then they come in to see me and I say, let me lay this out for you and let me try and explain this to you in a way that it's probably going to take a little while for you to totally get the hang of. It does make sense. And they are relieved to hear that. You know, this family that I was just talking to you about, when they came to talk to me when they found their way to me, I said, all right, we're going to go in a different direction. We're not going to give her her own water bottle. We're not going to have you do this ceremonious emptying of the dishwasher. We're not going to have you make different foods so that she'll only eat the foods that she approves of. We're going to start talking about worry. And I gave the mom the vocabulary and the language to talk to her daughter about it. The daughter was game some of the time, but of course the daughter is like, I just want you to take the worry away. But they really worked on it. And the improvement over the last few months has been remarkable. They are like star pupils, but the mom really had to listen to me and really had to get that we're going to get out of the content and we're going to talk process. Some people get it really quickly. I was talking to a, doing a consult with a therapist uh, the other day and man, this guy, he just got it. It's like, huh? It's like when you hear this perfectly tuned instrument or this perfectly harmonious voice, right? He just got it, but it's hard. It's hard for a lot of people. And, And this is where I talk about sort of the culture of anxiety in families. And I talk about that safety chatter that if you have a family that's really sort of like, oh, that fell on the floor. Don't touch that. Oh, you know, come here, wash your hands. Then it's more likely that that's where the content is going to grab onto because as parents were modeling that germs are everywhere and they're dangerous. I just want kids to recognize that germs are everywhere. So for me, the opposite would be like, I remember driving in the car once with my boys and I reached down to get something and there was a jelly bean down like behind my seat and I found it with my hand and I pulled it out and I was like, ah, jelly bean. And I popped it into my mouth. Like that's what they saw me doing. Um, Yeah. Oh yeah. That was, that was a lesson. Yeah, that was a joke. I was totally consciously thinking about that. Yeah. Right. Uh, one time they were little. I think you've probably heard this story, Robin. And we were at the grocery store. So they were like two and four. So going to the grocery store was just a total adventure anyway. So as I was loading up the groceries and getting them bagged, you know, like they have those candy machines at the grocery store, you put in a quarter and you get some Skittles or whatever. So they would run over there and with their little fingers, they would they would sort of go inside and see if there was any leftover Skittle. And there were some stuff that was dropped on the floor. So a woman came over to me nicely and she said, I just want to let you know that your little boys were over there eating candy off the floor. So I, I feigned, I feigned that I was, you know, horrified. Oh my gosh. So I call them over, guys, guys, come here. And I say, you know, trying to be, show everybody that I'm a good mom, like, hey, listen, it's not good to eat the candy off the floor in the supermarket because the floor, we don't want to eat candy off the floor. And my oldest son goes, mom you know that the floors in the supermarket are way cleaner than our floors at home. (laughs) I was like, yes, that's probably true. Yeah. But anyway, my kids don't have germ phobias. I could tell you that. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a matter of, of paying attention and not all of the phobias that kids develop are based on something that was specifically modeled for them. But it is oftentimes we can see that there's some sort of the parenting style of, you know, oh, be careful, oh, watch out, oh, oh, right. We do, I do see that a lot with kids that are pretty phobic. Yeah. 
And it's really okay for your kids to be afraid of something. It's normal for your kids to be afraid of bumblebees if they've heard about a bee sting or gotten a bee sting. It's normal for kids if they watch a scary movie to be afraid of vampires. It's normal for kids if you're, you know, if you if they say jaws to then be worried about sharks in the ocean. It's okay. We just have to talk them through it without then going on the quest to arrange the world so that nothing makes them feel anxious. That's the problem. Of course, your worry is going to show up. Of course, of course, of course. Right? How do we manage it? So we'll be right back after this short break. Robin, do you like to get cash back when you shop? Of course. Who doesn't? Exactly. So you and our listeners need to know about Top Cash Back. It's actually a free service that allows you to get money back when you shop online. Top Cashback has a wide variety of categories on their site, from fashion to beauty, travel, and more. With over 7,000 retailers, including Amazon, Sephora, Walmart, and Nike, the average Top Cashback member saves $400 a year. Best of all, there's no minimum for a payout. It's free to join. Try Top Cashback for yourself by visiting topcashback.com, creating an account with your email and password, and entering the promo code FLUSTER. Plus, all new customers who sign up now will get a $10 sign-up bonus when they spend their first $25 on topcashback.com after entering the promo code. So hurry, grab this promo offer to start saving on your shopping immediately. Top Cashback is the most generous cashback site in the USA. They offer shoppers money back on everything they purchase through the Top Cashback website. So go to topcashback.com now and start getting money back when you shop. I've tried a few other meal kits over the years, but some of them can be pricey. That is not the case with every plate. Every plate is 25% cheaper than grocery shopping, and the meals are delicious and simple to prepare. They come together in just six steps and are ready in about 30 minutes. For me, it was actually less than 30 minutes. Who wants to spend time grocery shopping during the summer? In the summer, I'd rather be outside, enjoy the sunshine, than cooking in my hot kitchen. Every plate helps me do just that. These are simple, stress-free recipes that are easy to do at the end of a fun-filled day that you can do quickly with your family. And I live with big eaters, so we need food. The meals we get from every plate are delicious and have enough food for my family. The flavors were great. One night we had pork with carrots and mashed potatoes. That was quite delicious. Another night we had a chicken stir fry with ginger rice. Everybody loved it. We like healthy food and we have high standards. I loved making these meals and serving them to my family. Every plate offers options for everybody. Choose from classic plate, veggie plate, family plate, and easy plate preferences to serve up crowd-pleasing meals night after night. Try Every Plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code FLUSTER179. That's right. Try Every Plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code Fluster 179. That's up to $104 of value. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. Do you find that with older kids, I know the the game is so much about externalizing the worry and giving mm-hmm. it a name, but if they are of a certain age, do you think just talking about the worry in a separate way is enough without giving it a name? Yeah. I mean, sometimes there's resistance to that. Um, what I say to older kids sometimes is, look, I want you to be able to not listen to everything that you think. I want you to push back against this pattern of worry that shows up. So let's give it a name of somebody you find annoying. Who's somebody that when you talk, when they talk, you kind of internally roll your eyes and go, oh my gosh. And then I'll say like, except your parents because they're sitting right here and it'll hurt their feelings. You know, so they'll come up with the name of somebody. They can create a character where it's somebody who's just like yapping in their ear. And so that their resistance to it is like, oh, please. You know, I say to older kids all the time, I want you to throw an eye roll at it. 
I want your worry to be annoying. It depends on the age of the kid. I just have to bump up the language a little bit and I'll explain the rationale behind it. I'll say, look, we're going to pull it out and externalize it. I get it that you don't really have a worry part named Salvatore, but it just gives us a way to visualize it. So it gives you some separation from it because my goal is for you to recognize the pattern of this thing. And that's just a way for us to visualize it. And then they're usually game. Right. I think as a family, if you want to go down this path, we have other names in our family that aren't really related to this process. Mm -hmm. But I think I've mentioned to you, it's a long story how it came about, but I'm a, I'm a mom who doesn't really indulge in a ton of sugar and junk food. But mm-hmm. when I'm like, oh, why not? When I'm doing that, my name is Cindy Collins oh, instead yeah. of Robin. <laughs> yeah. totally and, and so, and so, <laughs> so it happened out of a joke. But the point is like the family understands like we have these different parts of us. Right. And so the idea of talking about like, oh, Cindy Collins is the mom who gets us junk food. It's not yeah. our mom. Right. But that's what I think the externalizing is fun as a game. And then if it's more serious, like this is the part of you that worries. This is the part of you that gets really angry. This is the part of you that does this. You know, they've already been prepped with that sort of concept. And I think that it also just makes kids understand that we all have different parts of us. And so that's the the externalizing of the part is just a universal thing that we can all do. Everybody has a worry part. And it just gives us some language to talk about it that makes it sound less pathological, which is what I'm always trying to do also. So you just have to play with it. And it really takes practice. It's hard to not jump in and to give those content-based reassurances. We want to do that. But if we start talking to kids about how their imagination and how their worry can team up and get them, rather than stepping in and trying to eliminate things or change things, as soon as we can get kids to understand this is how worry works, oh my gosh, you're way ahead of the game. You're way ahead of the game. It, you know, it takes a little work and it takes a little bit of a shift, but the key thing to remember is that it's not about the content, it's about your relationship with worry because the content is going to change developmentally, it's going to jump around. For some people, it sticks with one thing, but for a lot of people, it moves around. So, Being able to understand that, such a wonderful gift that you can give to your kids because it really is about emotional management and how do we handle these normal parts of our human brain that throw this stuff at us. Yeah, just because we've, my husband, your brother, we've learned this stuff doesn't mean that we just don't have to use it and work at it every day. Of course. Yeah, we have to use it and work at it. I'll tell you, I just was talking to my mom the other day and my mom is about to be 79 years old. And she told me I could tell this story. Actually, I asked her. Yeah, but I doubt she said, go ahead and shout out my age. Okay. Well, she looks fabulous for her. She age. does. She does. She does. Okay. Sorry, mom. Mom, you look you look awesome for your age. Everybody should know that. Yeah, she's just yes, eternally she does. youthful. Yeah. So but the reason I shouted out your age, mom, is because even even people who've been on the planet for almost eight decades still have to work on this. But here's the point in my story. They went down to Boston. So we live in New Hampshire. They went down to Boston this weekend for the first time since COVID. COVID. They've been really, you know, quarantining, of course. And my mom said she was really nervous about going back into the world and traveling into Boston and getting her hair cut and having this outing. She said she was so nervous. So she listened to last week's podcast where we talked about being socially rusty. And she just said she just had to talk herself through it. And she had to say to herself, I feel really nervous and this is okay. And I haven't done this in a long time, but I'm going to go and do it anyway. She really did a good job of recognizing her worry showing up and being able to have a conversation with it and still being able to go and get her hair cut. And once she got there, she was fine and her hair looks awesome of course. But I think that's a really important thing to remember is that we are continuing to work on this. And it's really just part of being a human being that we want, that we can always model for our kids. I don't do it perfectly either. I have my own worries that pop up for sure. I am not a worry-free person by any any measure at all. (laughs) I also want to tell you one other cute story because I had a conversation with my friend that used to live down the street from me and our kids grew up together and went to preschool and elementary school and then they moved far, far away. But she called me the other night because she had to ask me something. And she said she's been listening to the podcast, just a dedicated listener. And she said it's really helped her through the dark times of going through COVID. 
again, I got her permission to share this too. She said that she really listened to what I was talking about with connection, that how important connection was. And so she started having every day during the the winter months, and she said they've just started trickling off a little bit now, but every day she's been having a tea party with her family. She's got a daughter who took a year off from college. She's got two other teenagers at home. And they had a tea party at four o'clock every afternoon. She got out the china which she had to hand wash, she told me. And she sometimes would bake something. They would have like little tea sandwiches. But she said it became a really important ritual of connection for them during a really tough time. So I just wanted to share that because it just is so lovely. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And so props to you, my friend. I love that story. Yeah, the regular time we make for our that family time, we just did a very long road trip as a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you really just be, you know, as a yeah. family for several hours a day in a car? So <laughs> did you bring we, your um, did you bring your por- your porta potty with you? We broke my car with the porta potty. <laughs> I fear <laughs> we were like we actually, you know, the tent we jammed it under the seat, and we can't get it out now. So I have to go. Oh. <laughs> I have to actually have someone help me get it out. So join our Facebook community so you can ask Lynn a question and connect with our listeners. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn.